your heart was moved to tears Can you look back on that moment after all these years On the moment love broke through and heaven seemed so near do you remember the time your heart was moved to tears? Do you remember the day you first let Jesus in? How he gently and tenderly washed away your sin Well don't you know that he still cares The way he did back then Do you remember the day you first let Jesus sin Keep holding on, never letting go. We're not far from the end of the road. Keep holding on, never letting go. We're not far from the end of the road. In the moment love broke through, and heaven seemed so near. Do you remember the time your heart was moved to tears? Well, good morning. Can y'all hear me in this thing? So as y'all know, I really don't like the lapel mic, and it's always fallen off of me. So we're trying this today. Well, it is my honor and pleasure to be able to give God's word to you this morning. As y'all know, I love to preach. I love to give God's word. But um, yeah, it's an absolute honor to be able to stand before you, my, my family, my congregation, to be able to preach God's word. Thank you, Steve, for the wonderful introduction. And yes, my mom is here today, so uh, if you get the chance, go by and hug her and thank her for raising me because I have everything to owe her. She's a fantastic mother. Uh, and David, thank you so much for all of your faithfulness to be able to lead the congregation in worship. That is a very special thing, and we know that this isn't goodbye. You better not be going anywhere on us, so you better stay here. <laughs> So if you will, turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Uh, as uh, Pastor Steve has already mentioned, we are in a series, and this series is called The Wonderful Names of Jesus. 
If you read through the Gospels, if you read through the epistles, you say that Jesus is called by so many different names. And in the Old Testament, prophets talk about this coming Messiah, this coming person. They call him by all these different names. And each one of these names is meant to talk about something of what Jesus came to do. It talks about something of his purpose, what Jesus came to accomplish on the earth. And so today we're going to jump into one, but while y'all are turning to Matthew 26, and I hope you have your Bibles because we're going to be absolutely everywhere uh, in Scripture today. But while you're turning there, uh, I just want to tell you a little story about when I was in the third grade. I think it was third grade, probably. It's hard to remember what grade way back then. But I was probably around the third grade, and I loved dogs, right? What third grader doesn't love dogs? And one day... I thought myself to be the luckiest third grader in all of the world because I found a dog. I wasn't even looking for a dog. We just found a dog. And of course, I took this dog to my parents and I was like, can I have this dog? Can we keep this dog? He came to me. He loves me. Uh, this is my dog. So of course, we're going to keep it, right? So my mom said, yes, we can keep the dog. And so since this dog was a stray and I knew nothing about him, I figured I would start by giving him a name. And I named this dog Max. Max was my dog. That's the name I called him. But sometimes I wonder, was that his name, though? Like, was his name Max? How do you really know? When, you, when we name an animal, is that the animal's name? How do we know if that's what the animal wants to go by? So, like, Max was a stray... I didn't get him as a puppy. He was an adult dog, and I named him Max. But for all I know, his name could have been Frank his entire life. <laughs> but I just changed his name to Max, right? So when we get to the scriptures and we look at the names of Jesus, the most common name that people use in the New Testament to refer to Jesus, you can probably guess it, is Christ, right? Jesus Christ. In fact, it's so it's so common to refer to Jesus as Jesus Christ that some people think that's even his last name, right? Like Joseph Christ and Mary Christ came together and they had Jesus Christ, right? But no, it's a, Christ is just a title of Jesus. It's the Messiah, the anointed one. But this is the most popular name that Jesus is called. But if you read through the Gospels, this is not the most popular name that Jesus refers to himself as. Jesus almost never refers to himself as Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus, he is Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. But every time that Jesus is called Christ, whether by the disciples or by the Sanhedrin, as we're about to see, Jesus, he recognizes that, yes, I am the Christ. But then he flips it, and he calls himself our name that we're going to focus on today, and that is the Son of Man. Jesus says, yes, you said I am the Christ. But now I tell you, the Son of Man has come to be high and lifted up. So hopefully you've made it to Matthew 26, and we'll see one of these examples. Jesus is before the Sanhedrin. He's just been arrested, and he's before the high priest Caiaphas. And Caiaphas starts questioning Jesus, and we see that he calls Jesus the Christ, but Jesus flips it. So let's just start in verse 57 of Matthew 26, and you'll see this. It says, Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and he said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the hot right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. 
Then the high priest tore his robe and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do you need? Now you have heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Will you pray? Dear Father, we come before you ready and eager to hear from you. Lord, we have uh, read the first passage of several passages we will be in today, and we are expecting you to speak to us through it. Lord, I, I know that you have a word for us this morning, and you've already had many words for me as I've been studying this passage. So I just pray that you would give us the ears to listen, the heart to understand and apply what you have to say to us, to our Christian walk. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we ask for your help. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So the Son of Man. So this kind of sounds like a weird phrase. No one would ever say the Son of Man today. But if you really think about the Son of Man, you already know what this means. The Son of. To be the Son of something means to be either a descendant from something or from the class of something, right? So the son of, the class of, and then man. And this isn't the son of man as in he's the son of Joseph, a male. No, this is the son of man as in humanity. To say that Jesus is the son of man, to say that Jesus is calling himself, I am the son of man, is simply to say I am one of the class of humanity. Simpler put, I am a human. When Jesus says, I am the son of man, he is saying, I am the human one. Now, don't get me wrong, in this sermon, we are focusing on the son of man, and I'll give you a little teaser. Uh, Steve said I'm preaching two messages, so in uh, about a month and a half, I'll be preaching on Jesus, the son of God. So don't get me wrong, I recognize that Jesus is God. He is God that takes on flesh, but right now we're focusing on the fact that Jesus is the human one. He's human. So why is to be human Jesus' favorite thing to refer to himself? See, if you look at your outline in your bulletin, if, if you're someone that takes notes and likes outlines, I've outlined this sermon as humans, beasts, and the throne. And so today we're going to dive into these three seemingly random topics of humans, beasts, and the throne. And I think we will see throughout different things in the Old Testament leading back to this passage why it is that Jesus refers to himself as the human one. But see, if we're going to understand that Jesus is human, first I think we need to understand what does it mean to be human? What does the Bible say it is to be human? And so I've asked Robert to uh, play a song for us today. So just bear with me. You might not know the song, but just listen. But I'm only human, and I when I fall down. I'm only human, and I crash and I break down. Words in my head, knives in my heart. You build me up and the life fall apart. A clip from a song called Human uh, by this famous pop singer called Christina Perry. Who's heard that song? Anybody? Raise your hand. A few people have heard that song. So it's a really popular song, not really my style. I don't really listen to that kind of music. It's kind of cheesy pop music. But this song came out in 2013, and it's Christina Perry talking about, in her opinion, what it means to be human. See, if you listen to the song, she takes a step back from her life, and she looks at all the pain, all the suffering, all the times where she's fallen down, all the times that she's bled, and she concludes that this must mean I'm human. I'm only human. 
And I'm sure you've heard that term. That's a popular saying to say. Say, if I tripped and I messed up during my sermon, I could say, oh, guys, I'm only human. Of course, I'm going to mess up, right? And that's what that entire song's about. And it pervades our entire culture and so many cultures that to be human means that you mess up. To be human means you fall down. But I want to take a step back further and say, is this really what it means to be human? When God made humanity, did he intend humanity to be this thing that constantly messes up? See, I think if we go to Genesis, and you can turn to Genesis 1 with me if you want. Uh, If we go to Genesis, we will see that humanity was made for so much more than to mess up. God intended humanity to have this gigantic purpose on the world, and this purpose wasn't to sin. That's not why he created humanity. You see, in Genesis 1, you're all familiar with the story. God shows up on the scene of a formless and dark and void world. There's nothingness to it. There's no purpose. Chaos rules. But God steps on the scene. And God, he looks at this chaotic world and he decides he wants to give it purpose. So the very first thing he does is say, let there be light. And there was light. The darkness is gone. And then he looks at the world, and it's lit up, but you can still see all the chaos. There's still no purpose in the world. So God says, you know what? Let there be a separation between the water and the sky. And the next day, he says, let there be a separation between the land and the ocean. You see, God in creation, he's separating things. He's putting order to things and thus giving them purpose. And we see this purpose. He looks at the sky and he says, there's no purpose. So let there be stars. Let there be a moon. Let there be a sun. Give the sky something to live for. And he looks at uh, the sky just below that sky. And he says, there's nothing in there. So let there be birds to fill the air so that the air would have a purpose. He looks at the ocean and says the same thing. Let there be fish in the sea, so that the sea might have purpose. And then uh, earlier he had put grass on the land, and then he puts animals on the land. And so God, he shows up on a purposeless world, and he gives it purpose, and he steps back and looks at all of creation, and he decides on the sixth day that there's one thing missing. And in Genesis 1, 26, after God has stepped back and saw that everything's good, but it's not great yet. It says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God steps back. He looks at his creation, and he decides we need humanity. And humanity is going to be different than everything else I've created because humanity is going to literally be my image on the earth. And lots of times we like to look at this image and theologians especially like to like try to figure out what it is that makes us the image of God. Is it the fact that we have speech? Is it the fact that we can think? What is it? But I think the text is very clear. God has just created a kingdom. And what do kings do once they create kingdoms? They put a statue of themselves in that kingdom. So that everyone that shows up to that kingdom, the very first thing they see is this giant statue of themselves. And they know, everyone that walks in that kingdom knows that that is the ruler. That's the guy that owns this place. And so God, he looks at his kingdom and he says, I'm going to make humanity So that every time all of creation sees a human being, they know that there is a God and he rules over all of this. That's what we're supposed to be as humanity. 
And God says, as a result of this, you are going to be my representative rulers on the earth. He gave them three purposes. And uh, the youth, they get tired of me saying this because I talk about the purposes all the time. But it's because you have purpose, and those purposes are to be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth with God's image so that there will be no corner of the earth that people will not see that God is ruler. Fill the earth. Second is subdue the earth. We just saw in creation, God has ordered everything. He's put everything in its spot. And God tells humanity, keep those things in its spot. Keep the ocean where the ocean should be. Keep the land where the land should be. Keep the plants in line. I want you to subdue the earth on my behalf. Keep everything where it's supposed to be. Maintain the order. And then finally, he says, I want you to have dominion over all of the animals. Rule the animals. You are their king. But you're not their king because you're somehow strong and powerful. You're their king because I am your king. You are supposed to rule the animals on behalf of me. See, this is what it means to be human. It means to be created in the image of God, to have purpose, and to participate in God's creation. In fact, in Genesis 2, we see this exact thing. A pastor talked about it last week, how Adam went through and he got to name all the animals along with God. Adam is participating in the creation of the world in a way that God decided Adam should. See, this idea of I'm only human, it should be, wow, I am a human. That means I have the greatest standard, the greatest purpose on this earth out of all the other creations. I am a human. So, if to be human is to be this great thing, then why is it that Christina Perry could sing a song that says, I'm only human, therefore I fall. I'm only human, therefore I bleed. And we all say, that yeah, seems right. Why is it we can hear that song and agree with it if to be human is this amazing thing? And it's because of Genesis 3. It's because of the story as we continue. See, in Genesis 3, a serpent shows up. And when the serpent comes on the scene, it's this animal, this thing that humanity has been charged to rule over. But this serpent is something different. It's something evil. It's something that is wise. Scriptures say it's cunning. It has wisdom. And the serpent shows up and tells humanity, did God really say you need to rule with him? Why don't you just take rule for yourself? Why don't you just take the throne for yourself? Why don't you take this fruit that will give you wisdom and give you the, the ability to rule on your own? You don't need God. And sure enough, Adam and Eve, they think about it for a second, and they think, yeah, why are we ruling with God? God has given us dominion. Why don't we take it and run with it? All I need to do is eat this fruit, eat this wisdom, take in this ability to rule, and then I can rule on my own. I don't need God. And so in Genesis 3, we see that in the attempt for Adam and Eve to take rule for themselves, to exclude themselves from God's sovereignty and be sovereign themselves. In that attempt, we see that humanity actually becomes less than what it means to be human. You see, God designed humanity to be God's image bearers, but Adam and Eve rejected that image. Now, don't get me wrong. Every human being, even after we sin, we are made in the image of God, but in that moment, they have rejected what it means to be made in the image of God. They maintain, they maintain value, they maintain purpose, but they have rejected that purpose and gone a different way. And in doing that, they have become actually more like one of the animals than what it means to be human. So we've talked about humans and now how beast relates into that, is that human beings in choosing to sin actually become more like the beasts of the field than like what God intended humanity to be. And we see this all throughout scripture, if you pay attention, 
The very next story we get in Genesis 4 is the story of Cain and Abel. And we see that Cain, he was the firstborn, and then he gets jealous of his brother. And it actually says in verse 7 of Genesis 4 um, that sin is crouching at the door of Cain. Its desire is for him, but he must rule over it. See, God says, just like the serpent was crouching before Adam and Eve, sin is crouching before you, Cain. And if you don't rule over that sin, it will consume you. And the very next verse we get is that Cain takes his brother Abel, who he's jealous of, out into a field. And like an animal, Cain rises up and strikes his brother with the violence of a beast. Cain becomes a beast. He becomes more like the beast of the field than a human. And we, I could give you example after example of stories in the Bible where people become more like beasts than they become, than they are acting like humans. But I think one of the most clear examples is found in Daniel chapter 4. And we actually... I won't read Daniel chapter 4, I'll just summarize it, because Pastor actually was in Daniel chapter 4 last week. We're having a lot of overlap here. Uh, So in Daniel chapter 4, we get the story of King Nebuchadnezzar. He is the king of Babylon, the king that has sacked Jerusalem and taken the Israelites into captivity. And this king, it says that one day he is walking on his rooftop. And as he's walking on his rooftop, he's looking at his kingdom. And Babylon, historically, we know that it is a beautiful kingdom. King Nebuchadnezzar was a fantastic ruler in the sense that he knew how to get people to build beautiful things. But it says that he's walking on his rooftop looking at all the beautiful things that he has built. And says he's proud of it. He has this pride that comes in him. And he says, look at what I have done. Look at what I have accomplished. And so God actually comes and speaks to him and says, you think you accomplished these things? It was me. The only reason that you are a king, King Nebuchadnezzar, is because I, God, have given you the ability to rule. I have given you this rule. And in order to show you that, for seven years... God tells King Nebuchadnezzar that he is going to be out in the field grazing like a beast of the field. In fact, King Nebuchadnezzar is going to grow hair like eagle's wings. He's going to grow claws on his hands and on his feet like claws of a bird. And for seven years, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of one of the greatest cities in all of the earth, is going to be like an animal, a crazy man grazing in a field. A crazy man, this king. And so we see that God literally turns King Nebuchadnezzar into a beast of the field. He looks just like a beast, and it's because God is trying to show us that when we sin, when we try to rule outside of God, when we try to be human outside of recognizing the image of God in us, that we become like the beasts of the field. And it's not until, in verse 34, I'll read this, Nebuchadnezzar says, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. So we see it isn't until... King Nebuchadnezzar, as he's grazing like one of the beasts of the field, lost in his sin, it's not until the moment that he looks up and he says, actually, I get it, you are God. It's not to that point that he is restored to being human again. And King Nebuchadnezzar, he actually walks right back in, he takes his throne back, and he rules, but he's ruling differently now. He's ruling recognizing that God is the true sovereign God is king, therefore he is able to rule in what God has given him. King Nebuchadnezzar actually becomes a good ruler after that. But it's not until he 
denounces his beastly urge to sin, that he becomes what it means to be truly human. And the book of Daniel is actually all about this idea. In fact, if you're reading Daniel with this idea of what does it mean to be truly human, you will see that Daniel is a representative of a true human one. We see this all throughout the book of Daniel, but the most clear example is just two chapters later in Daniel 6. See, Daniel and Daniel 6, you all know this story. It's one of the most popular stories in all of the Bible. Daniel is, because of the scheming of the people that hate him, he is thrown into a lion's den. And while Daniel is in the lion's den, everyone expects to wake up in the morning and open the gates of the lion's den and see a really gruesome picture of Daniel just devoured by lions. But that's not what they see in the morning. They see Daniel sitting there with some calm lions, sitting with them, just petting them, right? So we see that Daniel, because he recognizes that God is God, because he recognizes that he only can rule if he recognizes God is Lord, we see that because of that, he actually for a night rules over the lions, these ferocious beasts. Daniel gets what it means to be truly human. But he is not the true human. He's not the son of man. Some people will argue that Daniel is the son of man in the Old Testament. But I think that that is absolutely false and you're not reading that correctly. Because Daniel is just an arrow. He's a pointer pointing to who is the true son of man. And I understand this because the very next chapter, which is finally what I was trying to get to. You didn't think I was going to get there. But Daniel chapter 7 Right after Daniel has ruled over the lions, right after Daniel has experienced King Nebuchadnezzar turning into a beast and back into a human, it is at this point that Daniel has a dream. And this dream is about the true son of man coming into the world to restore humanity to what it should be. See, and I'm sure many of you know this dream. Uh, it's a very confusing dream. Uh, actually, it's so confusing that the Bible has a passage right after explaining what the dream meant so that you don't miss this. Uh, but just picture this with me. Daniel, he's having a dream, and in this dream, he sees this ocean churning at night. And then all of a sudden, these four winds of heaven, they come and they stir up the ocean and churn it even more. And while the ocean is churning, the sea is churning, we see that four great beasts come out of the ocean. See, it said one was like a lion and had eagle's wings. The next beast was even more terrible. It was a gigantic bear that one side was bigger than the other and it was ready to attack and had three ribs in its mouth ready to devour anything that comes in its way. And then the third beast was like a leopard, but it had four heads and it was gigantic and it had wings like a bird ready to swoop down and devour anything that came in its path. And the fourth beast was so terrifying that Daniel doesn't even have anything to describe it with. He says, um, it was terrifying and dreadful and extremely exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts before it and it had ten horns. See, Daniel sees these gigantic, great, terrifying beasts that he can hardly describe. And it says later in the interpretation, we won't go there, I'll just tell you that these four beasts represent four kingdoms of the world that have turned to their beastly natures. They've rejected God and they have decided to rule on their own accord and they rule as these terrifying beasts. See, these four beasts, lots of theologians like to debate which uh, kingdoms these beasts are. The most popular is that these beasts are Babylon, Persia, and then Greece, and then Rome. But I, I'm not worried about that right now. What I'm worried about is the fact that these kingdoms are represented as beasts because they have given over to sin rather than ruling with God. 
these kingdoms represent what is wrong with humanity, that we have sinned and we have a problem that turns us into beasts. And if you don't recognize humanity as beasts, if you don't see that in today, then you're not looking. See, lately, every time I turn on the news, I just fall to my knees because there is so much beastly people in this world. People that have the audacity to take a gun and go in a crowd and just mow people down. People that just hate instead of love in this world. It's full of it. This world is full of beasts, just as terrifying as these four beasts Daniel describes. It's everywhere. And so what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about these beasts that come? Well, in Daniel 7, verse 9, Daniel, he looks away from the beasts and he sees something else. It says, as he looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair of his head was pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came about and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So Daniel, after he got, gets done looking at these terrifying beasts that humanity is, he looks and he sees an even more awesome scene. He sees the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days, God, the Eternal One, Yahweh, he sees him getting up in his throne room. Imagine all these thrones in the Ancient of Days takes his seat in his giant loftly throne and he's calm. He sits down, he opens his book of judgment and he gets ready to destroy these beasts in due time. We see a picture of the Ancient of Days. He is calm, he's ready. He, he's not shaken by these beasts. To him, they might as well be little puppies they don't hold a stick to God. But it says that the beasts were killed, and it doesn't really say how the beasts were killed. Somehow, God, the Ancient of Days, is involved. But when we continue on in verse 13, we see another figure that's involved. Now, remember, I said there's thrones, plural, which means that when the Ancient of Days takes his seat, there's still some empty thrones. So in verse 13, it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, right? Just like Genesis 1.28. To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that should not be destroyed. See, we get this picture of the Ancient of Days sitting down in a throne room with empty thrones. And why are the thrones empty? Well, I think if you go back to Genesis 1, you understand that God intend, intended humanity to rule alongside of him, rule as his representative ruler. So Daniel gets a peek of God's throne room, and there's an empty throne, of course, because humanity is supposed to be sitting on that throne. But we sinned. We messed up. We became more like the beast of the field than what it means to truly be human. So that throne is empty. God intended for it to be filled. That's why it's there, but it's empty. But then Daniel sees this, this person like a son of man who shows up on the clouds. 
this amazing human that seems to be demonstrating what it means to truly be human. He's, he's, manipulate, he's manipulating the clouds. That he comes riding on a cloud. And he, along with the Ancient of Days, destroys the beasts. And then he goes up. And this son of man takes his seat next to Yahweh himself. This son of man fills that empty throne that humanity is supposed to fill. And Daniel says that God tells him that he will have dominion forever. People will always praise him. He has the kingdom that humanity was supposed to rule from the beginning. This is the son of man. So now, real quickly, if we'll turn back to Matthew 26. I hope you understand a little bit better on why Jesus preferred this term, son of man. The true human one. The one who has come to get rid of the beastly nature that humans have exhibited. And so when Caiaphas, the high priest, says, are you the Christ, the son of God? What he's asking, are you the anointed one? Essentially, are you the one who has come to take my job? Because priests were the anointed ones. But Jesus says, yeah, I've come to take your job. He says, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus right here is saying to the high priest, you know your Bible. You know Daniel 7. You know that there is a coming son of man who will come and take his throne next to Yahweh. And I'm that man. He's saying I have equality with Yahweh. I am what humanity is supposed to be. I am going to be the one to rule with God. And so now you understand the high priest's response. He tears his robes because he knows Daniel 7. And he says he has uttered blasphemy. He has claimed equality with God. No human being can sit on a throne next to God, but he is claiming to. And so it's at this point that they take Jesus and they say he deserves death. And they slap him and they spit on him. And they say, prophesy to us, you Christ. If you're really the son of man, if you really have equality with God in your humanity, then tell us who struck you. But notice that Jesus, he says that, yes, I am the son of man. And he says, I tell you, from now on, you will see the son of man. From right now on, I'm about to take my throne. And then Matthew gives us a picture of Jesus taking his throne. Matthew describes Jesus as one who is dragged off and tried before Rome, one of the beasts. He's found guilty. He's beaten. But then it says in verse 27 of chapter 27, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole baton before him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And they twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. See, Matthew in his gospel gives us a picture of Jesus taking his throne. And it doesn't look like what we expect. Jesus takes his throne by being dragged off and beaten. He gets a purple robe that a king would wear. He gets a crown a crown of thorns, and they literally bow down to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews. But in their mockery, they're actually proclaiming Jesus to be what he is, and that is king. See, Jesus' humiliation on the cross becomes his exaltation. And get this, Jesus is going to be high and lifted up, so they nail him to a cross he becomes high and lifted up. And this instrument of death called the cross becomes 
Jesus' throne that he pronounces the end of death from. This instrument of death becomes Jesus' throne that he pronounces the end of sin, the end of the beastly nature. Jesus' humiliation becomes his exaltation. Now, I know I'm just about out of time, but I want to tell you one last story before uh, we finish today. Uh, It's back to Max, my dog, right? So I have Max, and I love Max. He's my dog. I don't know his name. It could have been Frank, but I called him Max. And at my school, we had, it was kind of like a talent show, but it was more specific. It was a pet show. So I went to a private school. We did a lot of really cool events uh, when I was younger. And we could bring our pets, and we had a contest to see which pet could do the best trick. And so I was like, I have this dog, Max. He's brilliant. He found me. Uh, So I thought, Max is a fantastic jumper. Like He was a Jack Russell Terrier. If you know them, they have lots of energy. They bounce around. He literally didn't walk. He bounced everywhere he went. And so I got a hula hoop because I was this brilliant young man that was going to capitalize on the fact that my dog can jump. And I decided to teach Max how to jump through a hoop. So I I would hold the hoop out, and sure enough, I taught him nothing. This dog just knew how to do it. He jumped through the hoop. I was like, this is fantastic. I'm going to win. And so I took the hoop, and I taught him how to jump. He got better and better at jumping through this hoop. And I thought, you know what? It's going to be real impressive the higher he can jump through the hoop. So every day, I would raise that hoop up a little bit. And sure enough, Max, he was a brilliant dog. He jumped through the hoop every day. Higher and higher and higher, he jumped through that hoop. Until one day, I was going to bed at night, and my mom comes in my room and tells me, hey, Max has jumped over the fence. (laughs) And I felt awful. (laughs) I realized, like... My dog didn't just jump over the fence. I taught my dog how to jump over the fence. And so sure enough, my mom, she runs out. She, she finds Max. We get Max back in the yard. And then in the middle of the night, he jumps over the fence again. And I never saw Max again. I never saw that dog. I have pictures of him. He was real. But he became someone else's dog. So Jesus becomes true humanity when he comes to this earth takes on flesh lives a perfect life and then through his humiliation is exalted to the throne that humanity belongs on you see it's only through jesus's death through his resurrection and through his literal ascension to god the father to sit at his right hand it's only through that that we as the beastly humans who chose sin over god can be restored to what it means to be truly human see the son took on flesh in order to lead us into what it means to truly bear the humi- the humanity that we bear it's only through christ We could be like King Nebuchadnezzar and pretend we have rule, but we will only be humbled. It's only when we choose to humble ourselves and call Christ as Lord that we find that we are actually restored to what it means to truly be human. So if you are sitting here today and you have never called Christ Lord, if you've never taken a look at Christ's humanity and thought there's something different about him and I want it, if you've never taken this for yourself, I know pastor is going to be here in just a second. I'll be down here in just a second. We would love to talk to you about what it means to make Christ Lord and to, in him, become truly human. But if you've already done that, just recognize that while Christ pronounced the end of death, we are still waiting for his second coming for him to finish. We're still waiting for that, but that is our hope. And when you look around and you see the beastly things of this world like me, when you see all the terrible events that are happening in our country and so many other countries and in the entire world, just know that Christ has proclaimed an end to that. You are no longer part of that. So don't add to it. 
follow Christ, reject sin, die to your sin every single day, because it's a choice every single day. Don't add to the beastly things of this world. And then go out there and proclaim their end. Proclaim the gospel. Get as many people on board as you can. Tell people that you are a beast, maybe not put it in that language, but that you need to come to Christ. And it's only through him that you will become truly human. Let us pray. Dear Father, we come before you just in awe about all the things that you spoke of in Scripture, all these prophecies that you gave us, and all the words in the Gospels that teach us what you came to do. And Lord, we recognize that we even barely scratched the surface, that your word is so deep and it's so full. And I pray that... We wouldn't just use it to, to gain more knowledge, but that we would use your word to be better followers of you. So I thank you that you came and you were the true human one. Thank you that you have pronounced the end to the beastly nature of sin. And I pray that you would help us as we, in you, also defeat death. Also, reject sin and look to, towards you. Lord, we need your help with that. We love you. We praise you. We ask for you to move during this time of invitation. It's in your name we pray. Amen.